Thank you. Good. So uh, many thanks uh, to Peter and uh, Nigel for uh, that um, really stimulating session, which uh, just concluded. We now move on to what for me has been one of the most um, anticipated sessions for today's session, and that is the Cayman Islands success story. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Peter has been speaking about this for quite a while, but it really was when I attended the business roundtable discussions that the actor Lockjaw Global School hosted. And I heard uh, economist Mala Dukran talk about the fiscal discipline of the Cayman Islands and how they really stand out uh, in the region in terms of uh, how they've been able to manage their financial sector. It really um, brought home to me uh, the fact that we have these kinds of stories that we can learn from and help position ourselves in the region. So I'm, I'm really happy we were able to connect um, with uh, Paul Biles and that he was willing to share with us today. So um, uh, also I'm very happy we have um, Ole uh, Bjorn Roste from um, Norway who is going to be sharing as part of the panel and uh, Mariano Brown himself, our CEO of the, the Atom Global School. Now, um, Shelley, I'm going to hand over to you, but as I've been sharing uh, since morning, we are managing time with these sessions, so we don't expect you to share uh, much details on their profiles because these are all available in the agenda for our participants. Um, I hand over to um, Shelley now. Shelley Bend is the legal director at a Trident Trust Company, which is located in the British Virgin Islands. Trident Trust is an organizational member of CCGI, and we are quite happy to have Shelley um, take this part of the session as moderator for us this morning. Shelley, I have you. Thank you, Kamala. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be a moderator for this session, and I'm very excited to learn all the secrets for Cayman because there is uh, definitely uh, an ongoing rivalry between the BVI and uh, Cayman Islands. So I'm very interested to hear what um, Paul is going to, to tell us this morning. So um, as you're aware, Paul is a director of FTS, um, which provides regulatory and economic consulting services. He's written, written several books um, on the offshore financial uh, uh, sector, including a, a book entitled Inside Offshore, which focuses on Cayman Islands. So he is eminently um, poised and positioned to, to give us uh, this information uh, in this session this morning. Um, and as panelists, as, as Kamala said, we have Mariana Brown, who's the chairman of Elita Management Services uh, Company Limited um, and has held uh, cabinet portfolios in, in Trinidad. He's also a chartered accountant. And um, the other panelist is going to be Mr. Ule Bjorn Roste. Um, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So without any further ado, we're going to invite um, Paul to give us his presentation. Okay, hopefully you can still hear me okay. Um, I'll, it'll be about 10 slides, so it will be uh, uh, concise. Um, the, the formal presentation will be at least and then hopefully in the discussions, we can sort of get into things a bit more. I think that might be a slightly more value added approach. So I'll just go ahead and I'll just kick right off. Um, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the industry in Cayman and how it has developed just very briefly. Um, I'm going to also touch on the international challenges um, that we have faced and not just us, obviously, all the jurisdictions have faced over the past couple of decades in particular. Um, then I will sort of give my uh, summary of some of the key features of, of why uh, Cayman has been successful. And then maybe some lessons for, you know, for the rest of the, the IFCs as well. And I think we can conclude with that. So um, very briefly, um, I obviously am I'm a former uh, regulator. I used to be head of policy at the Monetary Authority. And I've done quite a lot of work um, with the with the uh, with the government in terms of like on the strategic side, um, worked on economic planning, developed lots of policies for the regulatory regime and so on. So that's kind of my background. And for the past fifteen years, um, I've been um, in consulting, um, which on some occasions I've also worked worked with the governments, including actually once or twice with the BVI. Uh, so that was a, a real pleasure as well. 
Um, so I bring my perspective as, as someone who's uh, an economist who has worked in the financial services sector all my, all my life, basically, um, and then heavily involved on regulatory and kind of policy initiatives. So where does it start? Um, in the Cayman Islands, basically it started off as a banking center. Um, if, you, if you do any research on the history, you will see that back in the, the mid 50s, uh, late 50s, early 60s, um, Cayman Islands started to attract a few banks. Um, it wasn't until sometime in the 70s, I think it was, um, that it, banking really kicked off in Cayman. And actually, it, it, the story goes, I was obviously a, a kid at the time, so I can't say I was there and I can tell you exactly how this, this occurred. But the story is, I think one of the other jurisdictions was having some, some issues at the time. I think it was the Bahamas. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And uh, quite a few of the, the, the banks decided to re-domicile and they re-domicile to Cayman. And it is said that if you were to compare the charter list of banks for the Bahamas, um, and then you compare it to the new list of banks in Cayman, it would be like almost the same list, except they were saying Cayman Islands in the parentheses rather than and Bahamas. Um, so we developed early on as a banking center um, um, by getting some of those banks that wanted to be domiciled to a different jurisdiction. Um, and so that banking was the main, was sort of the main thing. Um, came and quickly then moved on to uh, captive insurance. And I'll give you a little bit of history on where that came from. And then of course, what I call a key growth phase is on the hedge funds. So came and currently is domiciled for approximately 70% of all the world's uh, hedge funds. Um, we also have companies, just general international companies or outsiders, we'll call them offshore companies. And then we also have the service providers that had to come along to help all of this growth to, to occur as well. So let me go into it now a little bit more. So on banking, we typically measure our success or the size or the nature of our banking sector. We look at this, the financial size. So we look at the assets and liabilities. You can see there, there's been actually a, a decline but not surprisingly, still one of the major banking centers globally, because we have seen also a lot of changes in banking. We've seen a lot of consolidation, a lot of mergers and acquisitions in banking. Um, we have less licensees, um, but we still have pretty large, um, large portfolio, large balance sheet. Currently, I think around six, around 600 billion, I think in assets uh, in the banking sector. Um, so still, still very strong. Um, that's just a quick, I thought, you know, this would be good to see um, a picture sometimes is, is, is useful. That's how the Cayman Islands looks as far as its banks. And what I mean by that is the countries that you see in the legend are, that's where the banks originate from. That's where the shareholders are from. That's where the families or whoever is setting the banks up. That's where they're from. That's where the headquarters are. And you can see it's pretty, pretty diverse. Um, with uh, North America being around 25% and still have in the Caribbean as well, we have the 20% of the, of the banks, um, Asia, Australia featuring heavily at 16%. And of course we have a lot of South American banks, uh, which is our second largest category at 23%. But you'll see a very broad sort of coverage and a small number of banks in the Middle East as well. So that's kind of a profile. If I was giving you a profile of banking, I would say it's about, you know, just over half a trillion in assets and pretty fairly spread between those jurisdictions that you see there. The Cayman Islands all um, eventually um, moved into uh, insurance business. Uh, of course, we always had a couple of local insurance companies, right? Because every jurisdiction has that. Um, but we really ventured into captive insurance, um, which was a, a huge part of our success as well. Um, captives are essentially uh, self-insurance entities. And what do I mean by that? Um, just an example, um, if you are not able to get insurance because the premium was, was too high and you had enough people like yourself that needed that insurance, you could all get together and invest into your own insurance company, pay the premiums into that company, which is effectively your company. And to the extent that there are no claims or there are less claims, um, you can 
basically uh, get your premiums back, right? So what the Cayman Islands saw it was direct result of some issues in the United States um, in the late 70s, 80s, uh, which was that there, were, um, there was a, a change in the insurance market in the US and particularly on the healthcare side um, where se several states um, you know, had a really tough insurance market. Premium, premiums were very high. Um, institutions were unwilling to, to um, offer uh, coverage for uh, certain high risk segments and so on. And so there was an opportunity there um, for the Cayman Islands to serve as a captive jurisdiction. What does that mean? What that means is that the major health networks, the large um, hospital networks, the healthcare organizations in, in, in the US um, found ways to get their coverage by setting up their own insurance company. Setting up that insurance company um, uh, offshore in the Cayman Islands and then having there and being able to set the prices and the, and the premium to reflect their own risk. One of the really nice things about that is um, go back to our pre my previous example of whether you know I couldn't get insurance and we all could get together to form a company is that all of a sudden you find that the risk management within our organization is so much better. It's so much better of course, because we don't want to be paying out on the claims. We want to keep that as much of that premium as possible. So one of the nice things about healthcare captives is that those hospital networks have found that their overall risk management has improved significantly because basically it's their own money, it's their own company. Um, in Cayman, we have 90 domestic companies and we have 682 international, which are the captives. And um, most of the insurance industry is those captives. And the final point there is that the Cayman Islands is actually the single largest domicile in the world for healthcare captives. As a direct result of that story I told you earlier about what happened in the US and it's just grown from there. Having said that, we do face competition from several states in the US um, that are also captive domiciles as well. And their, their selling point is you know, why go all the way to the Cayman Islands when you can come here to Vermont or, you know, these other places um, and, and sort out your captive uh, solutions there. The next area, which is where I call the big growth phase, and this occurred in the mid 90s onward, and this has been the single most significant influencing factor on the Cayman Islands growth as a financial services center over the past decade, two decades. We now have approximately 12 and a half thousand funds and this number changes every day. Um, estimated to be around 70 to 80% of the global number of, of, of our hedge funds. Um, we continue to be one of the primary, it continues to be one of the primary growth factors for the industry. And those sub bullet points uh, show you why. Every fund needs to have audit services. Every fund needs uh, a board of directors and certainly independent directors. Every hedge fund needs uh, some compliance services uh, to comply with the Cayman Islands laws. Every vehicle that has to be set up, every vehicle that has to be managed uh, requires legal experts for that to occur. And of course, we also have banking services that are required for all of this. So that, that, that single sort of subsector has contributed significantly to our growth. That said, uh, the Cayman Islands success is probably better described uh, in this way, which is that we have somehow managed to not just have a niche sector, but we've managed to be a leader in the hedge funds, one of the top domiciles for banking, and that's compared to all other jurisdictions, and also second only to Bermuda in insurance. So, so while the hedge funds has been a significant growth factor, the Cayman Islands has managed somehow, uh, and we'll talk about that, how that occurred in a minute, um, to be a leader, meaning in the top two or three across several sectors um, at, at the same time. Some of the international challenges that we have faced um, are not new to any of you on this call, I'm sure. Um, I say no pain, no gain. Um, maybe no gain, no pain is more is more more uh, more accurate. But you know we have we have grown um, 
during a period of intense international and regulatory scrutiny, not just on the Cayman Islands, but on, on, on all IFCs. Um, intense is, 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 is really an understatement. Um, uh, there are goalposts uh, that are created and then moved and then made bigger and made smaller and then additional goals are added. It's, it's, uh, it's been one, one, one hell of a ride, I would say, over the past two decades. Um, I have personal experience with this because when I was head of policy at the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, uh, we were placed on one of those, you know, the famous blacklists for our money laundering regime. <laughs> And one of the things that we had to do at the time was to create the, the legislation and also to create a document called the Anti-Money Laundering Guidance Notes, which is effectively the standards for local industry to help them to comply with um, anti-money laundering um, regulations. I created that document. I was the person that drafted that document because we didn't have one at the time. Um, and shortly after introducing all of those things, we were um, uh, thankfully removed from that, from that blacklist. Um, the FATF, which is the global body for, that deals with anti-money laundering standards, as well as the CFATF, which is our Caribbean um, version of that, sets out these global standards and over the years have placed a lot of scrutiny, a lot of pressure um, on IFCs like the Cayman Islands to improve their uh, legislative regime. In more recent years, they have focused not so much on the laws that we have to have in place, but also on the extent to which they believe we are implementing the legislation and regulations. So now they're testing by carrying out reviews. They're looking at the regulatory bodies, how many enforcement actions, um, how many licenses have you granted, how many persons have been charged or entities have been taken to court, um, you know, how, how much um, teeth do you have in your regulatory regime and so on. And that's, that's been tough. And thankfully, we have um, we have passed um, those tests. We have done extremely well. I believe um, 38, I think, of the 40 um, uh, FATF recommendations are we're basically compliant. I think we have a couple of things we're working on for the last one, although I believe that was completed recently. Um, but that pressure has been pretty consistent. Um, I hope that we get to talk a little bit about the nature of that pressure in the in the chat afterwards, because I have some views on on um, on the extent of the pressure and 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 it is it is legitimate in some senses, but in other senses, it's not so legitimate. Um, the EU um, followed suit with the FATF and also um, has its own um, sort of list of non-cooperative jurisdictions, focused primarily on tax, but a little bit on anti-money laundering as well. And their basic point was we may have, uh, along with the OECD, is that we have tax regimes that are harmful. I certainly, that's my favorite topic, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit later on as well. But those pressures came requiring us to do what? Well, what we did in immediate response to that is we, we basically introduced um, you know, cross-border cooperation regimes where we are sharing information with other uh, tax authorities in in too many jurisdictions to count now, I've stopped counting at 50, I think. But basically a lot of the tax authorities around the world, uh, we're providing reports to them or they can approach us for a specific request as long as it, they can prove that it relates to um, a sort of a suspected tax breach and we are fully cooperating with them. Um, so, th that's, so that's the first thing is the AML and the second thing in the EU and the OECD attack. So those are the pressures that we faced and we responded very well to those pressures. We've continued to succeed. Um, and although it's not, on the, it's not up on the slide, I want to address the point. So the question is, if, you know, we are deemed to be doing something wrong or if our regime is weak or if there's something that we need to do to reach global standards, um, then we have certainly done our best to, to do that. If the idea is that we were getting clients because of that lacks in regulatory standards, because of those weak points, because of the things we didn't have in place or the enforcement that we didn't have, then I think that's another question because despite all of those regulations over the past two decades, we have grown in some areas almost exponentially. Um, all of the areas uh, has, have grown significantly um, despite all of those changes, which I, which I think proves 
Uh, another point, which I think might've been alluded to earlier in the previous presentation is that we're actually adding value. And no one is coming to Cayman because um, they're not getting value. There's something that we're doing here. One of the first things that I'd like to point out is that we have a very strong professional infrastructure. Um, and previous speaker did touch on that, talked about um, human capital and he's, he's so right about that. Um, we have some of the best attorneys anywhere in the world. We have some of the best accountants anywhere in the world. Um, that knowledge transfer has occurred. And also we have a lot of, of um, our local community, our Caymanian accountants and attorneys are growing up in an environment where um, they are among some of the, the, best, the best experts in the world and learning from them and they themselves becoming experts, starting their own firms as well, which is fantastic. But we have that strong professional infrastructure of service providers, not just lawyers and accountants, but compliance professionals, directors, um, and, and others who are, who are there to support any, any industry um, in, in its growth. Um, there's always been a strong working relationship between the public and private sector in Cayman. I know it's said a lot and people say it was sort of a cliche, but it's real. Um, I can give you examples, you know, back in, back in years ago, um, when the government is thinking about an industry, launching an industry, it sits down with industry and says, well, what, what do we need to launch this industry? Like, what, what are some of the things that you think your clients would be looking for? What, what kind of legislation do we need to have? And there was a very, very collaborative approach in terms of coming up with the legislation years ago. And it still occurs now, maybe not to the same extent, because also rules and reg regulation has changed a lot as well since then, right? And you'll find a greater distance now between the regulator and industry um, in these days simply because that's just the best practice. That's the global standard. That's what is, is purported to be the best thing to do. Um, but we still have to find a way to work together. So we still find ways there are working groups and the government still sits down with the industry every so often to talk about you know, their needs because you have to do that. And then we're very innovative. As I mentioned before, picking up on the idea or the problem of the healthcare captives back, back then in the US and the fact that these hospital networks couldn't get insurance well, great idea, why not, let's do that. Also, in, in the fund space, um, one of the really nice things about hedge funds, and you're wondering well, why hedge funds in Cayman, what's the point of that? Actually, it's because of the nature of the tax regime. And no, it's not because the tax regime allows someone to not pay their taxes. It's actually because the tax regime allows a neutral environment for taxation. The Cayman Islands has never, ever, ever in its history, and I can't go back that far, had ta direct taxation. So it, it hasn't, um, you know, it didn't, uh, 300 years ago, it didn't decide it wasn't gonna have direct taxation in order to do this today, obviously. Um, it just never historically had it, right? We always had indirect taxes and fees for services to the government, and that hasn't changed. That has turned out to be a great attraction a great attraction, not because people aren't being taxed, because they are, which I'll explain in a minute, but because it allows a neutral venue. Imagine five investors want to make an important investment, and they're from five different countries, one from Cayman, maybe in German, Switzerland, France, the US, and some other place. The Swiss person says, I'd like to set it up in Germany, or I'd like to set it up in Switzerland, because it would have a slightly better benefit for me. The, the, Fran the French investor says, I think I wanna set it up in this place because it may have a slightly better advantage for my company in terms of my ultimate taxation. What better solution than a place that has no tax so the fund can be set up there, domicile there, operate from there. Everyone can invest through that same vehicle. And then when the returns are provided to each investor, those investors in their own respective jurisdictions will get tax according to their own domestic environment. That's the point, that's the, almost the entire point of, of the growth of, of hedge funds in Cayman. The other point in terms of innovation and service offering is, is that you know, we have also added that professional infrastructure and provided lots of additional services to funds to make those hedge funds better. And that's now becoming a global standard. For example, 
having hundreds of independent directors provide services and insisting, for example, as um, actually our industry insisted on this many years ago, that the audit for the hedge fund be carried out uh, in, in the Cayman Islands as well. So I think we have, we have those factors to take into account. What are some of the lessons? Um, again, I'll move quickly and I hope we can have some discussion on this in a bit. In a bit. But what's the value of the service that you're offering? So if you are looking to be an IFC or if you're in a current IFC and you want to be more successful, you do have to ask the question, what's your value? What are you offering? If you are offering for someone to be able to set up a company very quickly in your country, and that means uh, weak regulatory standards or no regulatory standards, um, may, means maybe slightly higher risk, but you can get your company set up quickly, then that's not really a value. If you're offering for a way for your clients to do business where they get a financial value uh, and it doesn't breach any tax or regulatory laws, then you're, you're onto something. You could be onto something there. Um, the nature of the economy is my second point. Uh, what is the nature of your economy? So if you're an IFC or an offshore center as it's traditionally called, um, and you are focused primarily in one area, some jurisdictions focus heavily on trusts, some focus very heavily on insurance, some focus prim you know, primarily on banking, right? Uh, and then what if something happens to one of those industries from a regulatory point of view in terms of global standards or industry development, um, like a crash in the market, then you know, where do you sit? It's important that you have a suite of services that is broad enough um, so that you can diversify your risk as well as looking for new growth areas. So who survives is I think those with a really strong, uh, with, with more than one strong sector will have a higher chance of surviving. Um, third point, those with high regulatory standards will have a higher chance of surviving. And yes, some of those regulatory standards are being imposed just because they have, they have to be imposed. Not because there is any inherent weakness or issue that is being solved. A lot of regulatory standards are introduced because they have to be and they deserve to be and they're legitimate. But there are also some that are just being done so the jurisdiction can can be seen to cooperate with the global standards. This is all the jurisdictions are in a similar boat on this one. Um, they find themselves uh, introducing new regulations and new laws constantly um, to stay off, um, you know, purported lists, you know, black lists and gray lists and so on. And they do this because it's very important for their reputation, not because there is any intrinsic or always inherent risk or issue at hand that they're resolving. But it's a part of the, let's call it a part of the game, so to speak. It's a part of what needs to occur to maintain your, um, your IFC. Finally, on media and perceptions, and this is what prompted me some years back to write the book, Inside Offshore, is, you know, there is a negative perception. It continues despite lots of campaigning and lots of, um, you know, efforts by IFCs. It is not going to go away. Is not going to go away because it's partially um, influenced by the, the by Hollywood and entertainment. Um, you know, I always say there's no point saying in the next James Bond movie that the villain has his money in a bank in Idaho. Like nobody, that's not going to register with any viewer. Nobody, that doesn't make any sense to anyone. And so, what happens then is in the James Bond movie, the reference is made to the Cayman Islands or it's made to the Bahamas or it's made to Switzerland because that sounds like it makes sense. The issue with that is, that is a perpetuation in my view of a 1970s world when almost no jurisdiction had um, anti-money laundering legislation. The regulation was what it was back then, which led to several financial crashes as you guys will do the research and you will see, which then resulted in lots of improvement in regulatory standards as well. But it, it kind of, it's in the media's interest and it's in entertainment's interest to keep those, those perceptions going. Um, we have to do a better job as IFCs in terms of dealing with that, but I don't think we're going to deal with it by simply shouting, we're not a tax haven, we're not a tax haven, we're not a tax haven. We've been shouting that for about 26 years and it hasn't worked. 
So I think what we need to do is we need to make more direct efforts to educate the onshore policymakers, those people who are in Congress and in the parliaments, and that's where the education needs to occur so that they can understand more about what we do as IFCs, why we do it, the value we actually create. So it's not a sort of very flippant. It's not that we're just, things are passing through. We're actually generating value and give specific examples of that. And I don't want to go on for much longer, but I do want to say, I'll give you an example. I've seen water plants, factories, bridges. Um, I've seen direct, I've been directly involved in seeing these transactions. Um, I've seen lots of infrastructure. Um, I've seen all of those things financed in countries that need it desperately. And I've seen it happen primarily because the correct corporate structure was found to allow the investors to participate and make those investments. I can also share with you that a lot of so-called capital flight um, doesn't really fly anywhere. There's a lot of uh, financial flows that flow through vehicles and IFCs that end up benefiting directly the same jurisdiction where it came from. So I think all of those things, you know, we kind of need to talk about those things a bit more when we're educating the policymakers, um, because our future as IFCs, um, I think, is is depends a lot on us being able to to address some of those some of those issues as well. Now, if you're going to look at creating an IFC, let's say Cayman is successful, it is successful, and you want to do that. Um, how do you go about doing that? Is that even possible in this new environment? And I thought I would do this slide quickly because that's a big question. Um, there are many jurisdictions who, uh, which, which haven't got off the ground who are thinking about getting into this because it, it's, it's something that is not sort of physical capital intensive. Um, you know, it just requires good human capital. It, it's um, an industry that um, does not provide a heavy burden on your physical infrastructure. Um, it's great for, um, you know, sharing of knowledge and knowledge-based uh, activity. And there's, there's so many benefits to it. There's no magic formula, that's the first thing. Um, and everything that I told you in, in the history, um, I don't think I ever said once that the Cayman Islands uh, policymakers had an idea in 1955 that they were going to do this today. And then they created a special manual or a set of procedures or a strategy to do it. No such thing. What occurred was, good decisions along the way, which is which still continues to be important part of leadership in this area. And I think we made a lot of very good decisions at the right time, and we ended up where we are. Look at then versus now. We have September 11th, which completely changed the world as far as um, some serious aspects of regulation were concerned. We have increased competition. Um, we have lots of jurisdictions all around the world now interested in, in being an IFC and providing similar services. We have increased international scrutiny. I mentioned earlier, it's not going anywhere and it's getting, it's just, it will continue for many years to come. Um, we could talk about why in a minute. And we have more media attention, much of it negative, And with all the shouting from the rooftops as we have done and all the efforts and money spent on public relations campaign, surprisingly, the perception still remains. You know, the nice thing about all of this is that Clients in the, for the Cayman Islands still view the Cayman Islands for what it is. They see the value, they know the value, they know the people, they've been to the country. They can see it's a well-run place, um, it's well taken care of, we take care of our people and, um, and they can appreciate that. But, you know, and that's what's important to us on the ground, although it's, it's still important for us, all of us to, to ensure that we're managing that global reputation as well. There's much higher setup costs, far higher setup costs. You have to have a regulatory body staffed with dozens and depending on the size of your country, hundreds of, of personnel. Um, you have to create legislation. And even if you can, you can you know, mimic the legislation of other jurisdictions, you still have to write that legislation. You still have to implement it. You still have to have a department where people are enforcing it. You still have to have a court system that deals with it. Um, there's continued high demand for services, which is a good thing. Um, the product, the client service, the price on location is gonna be still important. The products are there. You can see what all the products that are offered in all the jurisdictions, not just Cayman. Um, 
the pricing of that, that's really up to the jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions will, will have a lower price, but they also have a different target client base. Some have a higher price because they think it fits with their brand. And any idea that's worth serious consideration needs to be considered. Um, and then that last point, what I'm gonna to say to you now is that on the, on the technology side, it's been so amazing the growth in terms of the companies that are, that are involved in all of the, the, the tech sectors and, and you know, the blockchain technologies and app developments. And, and a lot of that is centered around intellectual property. And I believe there's an opportunity here for all IFCs to take a closer look at how they can serve as centers of excellence um, you know, for managing slash protecting, promoting intellectual property for clients who are in, the, in, in all these areas. Um, the Cayman Islands has recently, I would say over the past 12 years or so, also attracted quite a lot of tech companies as well in the special economic zone that we have, which is, which is where those types of companies um, are, are domiciled. So I believe that you know, we're, we're, we're primed for growth in that area as well, but it's also a great idea for all the other jurisdictions as well, to the extent that they haven't considered it yet, to start looking at those sectors as well. So that's it from me. Uh, like I, said, I look forward to a bit of a discussion um, and I try to, to go quickly. Um, you can summarize the success um, as being in the right place at the right time, but also making the right decisions. You can also summarize that success in terms of making sure we had the correct professional infrastructure because clients won't be able to get anything done properly unless they have experts around them, advising them on what to do and helping them to set up the structures. Um, you can also link it to our uh, high regulatory standards, um, but also frankly to our willingness to um, implement the standards um, to maintain our, our reputational reasons as well as for practical reasons as well, which I think is, 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 is key. Um, but I'm gonna stop there now. I, I, hope, I hope that was useful and I'll, I'll pass over to the moderator. Thank you, Paul. That was, that was incredibly useful. Um, and it's, it's really good to note how um, being poised and prepared to take advantage of uh, an opportunity that arises somewhere else or a problem that arises, um, seeing that problem as an opportunity and responding with alacrity to um, create an opportunity, uh, create a new service, create a new industry out of that is really critical. I think a lot of the successful IFCs has, can probably attest to you know, the fact that they have seen an issue in another jurisdiction and have maximized uh, on that uh, in order to, to build an industry. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Ulla Bjorn Rosti. I hope I'm not uh, completely mangling your name, um, but to give some comments and a response uh, to, to Paul's, um, Paul's submission. Thank you, for, Paul, for the very interesting uh, uh, address here on the Cayman Islands. I must admit that I do not know very much of the, about the Cayman Islands, although I should, of course, know uh, more than I do. Uh, that is a feeling I often have, but you will get my views uh, tentative, summing up my views up till now, okay? And let me also say, before I say anything more, that uh, being here today, which is a, is a pleasure, but I speak only on behalf of myself in the capacity of uh, uh, associate professor and academic and independent observer. And uh, you may also know from my bio that I just uh, published the book, Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, and so forth, the title. So I have been a central banker for a substantial fraction of my life and also works with both monetary policy, uh, like Paul also has done, and investments uh, at the central bank. But what I say now is only my own views, and they may not be shared by many others. Perhaps, uh, what do I know? Perhaps not, not many at all, but still, th thanks a lot. And let me, let me to, to, to address this interesting topic, uh, return to the end of Paul's presentation here and put myself in the position of the average uh, James Bond movie watcher, you know, and, uh, and the, the perception of the Cayman Islands. 
I think that if you for 26 years have said that we are not a tax haven and, and it didn't work, then at least even if you still have that view, then you have to at least think that you need to need to do something to convince that uh, that uh, general citizen, uh, because of that I think is mainly the problem, if there is a problem, that, that the perception, whether it has been uh, whether Hollywood is to blame for it or not, you know, is uh, it, it is uh, it, it is there and you, it is real since it is there, and I think it is a it is a in the world that we live on in, in today the information age and everything becomes more transparent and the demands become higher and there is from time to time, international crisis, there's a pressure for resources, there is competition, also political competition. And in Norway this year, you have seen the pendulum swing back to the left again in politics, just like we saw in, in the United States, if you use the left-right axis, uh, so that uh, people now are more interested in, in uh, distributional issues. And if there is a common, uh, common uh, way to see this, that uh, some have a lot of money and it should be distributed more evenly. That is also a widely held view. So, of course, that, that may not be so very helpful in the in the position that, that you are in, but it's also a, a fact of, of the world. And I think that for, for, uh, for, for a country like the Cayman Islands, uh, it's mainly tourism based and the financial sector as I understand it. And uh, both of this you can see as a parallel also to Norway. Norway had to live with the sea and what the sea had to offer, and therefore became quite good at shipping and later on, uh, you know, petroleum industries. And, they, and they, for, for the Grand Cayman or for the Cayman Islands, it has been whatever the reason was for there being no direct taxes from the beginning. Uh, you know, that must have been very attractive for several institutions who decided to locate there. And it's also such that when many locate, more wants to follow because you have network externalities. It's a good to be in that location. And therefore it is robust to change, I think, uh, and also robust to some uh, attacks. And it also sounds that you have been quite good at addressing both competitive and regulatory pressures. But I think that from a normative standpoint, the, the regulatory pressures are uh, politically legitimate, or at least seen as such. And it's therefore important to to uh, to try and tell someone, <laughs> some other people also, in, in addition to the firms that are located there and the hedge funds, you know why what you're doing is good. And uh, the world is such that whenever you do something and get some good results. Others may be envious, or you know, the, even if if they're competitors or or in another position. So I think um, that is my main, what what I mainly get out of this. I think it, it's 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 very interesting to 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 get to learn here how you have dealt with these pressures that have developed for from from different angles and how you are, have been able to maintain your strong position in in uh, both banking. And hedge funds, uh, hedge funds, sorry, and insurance. So, so, so that's quite impressive. But also, it's understandable that not everyone likes this uh, very much. I think. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, let me stop here for now. I think. Thank you, Uli. Um, so we're going to let uh, invite Romano, um, Mariano Brown, sorry, to to respond to um, the presentation by by Paul. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, let's begin by, by, by congratulating Cayman on a, on a, a successful um, establishment, <laughs> as some being a successful business. Um, but the reality is when we look at it, uh, it is a dependency of Britain, um, as is the British Virgin Islands, as is Guernsey, as is Channel Islands, um, who by themselves, um, in a sense, form literally the core of what we would consider to be um, the home of offshore financial, uh, home offshore financial centers. Um, that raises a um, couple of issues in terms of trying to do the same thing. 
And the, the bottom line is that if you want to attract that type of money, that type of business, then by definition, you have to be cutting edge. And, and, and to be honest and to be realistic, I have to give Paul credit for that. They have kept up with all the changes that have been demanded by them, demanded of them or imposed upon them um, by other jurisdictions who in a sense have been jealous of their position. And we also have to realize that um, fundamental issue, um, Walter Restaurant said it a long time ago in 1984 when he re retired, he said there are only two kinds of money, money that is taxed and money that is not taxed. And all money is looking for a home. Right? And the reality is that Cayman is, is, is useful, is, is a strong point. And there's a certain similarity between Cayman, Bermuda, Guernsey, et cetera, where tax is concerned. In the case of Cayman, um, there's no capital gains tax, there's no wealth transfer tax, there's no income tax, there are indirect taxes. Um, and in a sense, a small country with approximately 68,000 people can, with a high volume of transactions, can probably manage that. Um, however, for other jurisdictions, which are a little larger, which want to come into that particular space, have always to be reminded of one, the fundamental institutional requirements. Um, and the fundamental institutional requirements has to do with the quality of staff. Um, he, Paul made that point. They always have the, the top edge of the game, but it's also supplemented by approximately one third of the population also having work permits and essentially bringing people in from outside. And that's the reality as well. But it is, it is par for the course. So that if you are in that type of business, then by definition, you are competing with the rest of the world and therefore you are required to have the resources that the rest of the world has. If you are also competing and that you're also going to be um, subject to the um, stringency of oversight from the OECD and EU countries um, who are conscious of uh, an aging population and the issue of uh, adequacy of their tax base, it's also going to be a situation in which you are going to be looked at. The spotlight is always going to be on you, um, precisely because you're doing something that they can't do, or perhaps if they do, they don't really tell too many other people about it. So the reality is, of, is that for you to compete, and for one to compete, for any Caribbean jurisdiction to be able to compete, then by definition, you have to be amongst the best in the world. And the reality is that in Cayman Islands, you have represented there, not banks, international money center banks, who are literally in corresponding with branches of international organizations. The same for the legal firms, the same for the accountancy profession and the accounting firms. So that it's a, you could say it's a holy trinity, um, keeping everything in position that is supported by the relevant services. But for anyone else attempting to do that, then by definition, they have to accept, and this is particularly true in the case of Trinidad de Vigo, which talks of an IFC. If you're not prepared to have your banking laws and the administration of those banking laws and the relevant laws operating at what one would consider to be an uh, international standard, then you have no hope of being in the game. That's it. Right? For you to be able to there to be in that particular type of market, for you to be able to offer those type of services, then by definition, you have to be able to be at the same level as Singapore, uh, as New York, as, as, as London. And that's one of the reasons why you have branches of those major um, legal firms um, within Cayman Islands and or, or companies which, for example, have well-organized links. You're not going to be home to 80% or, well, it is 80%. No, I thought it was 90% actually. Of most of the hedge funds which are created in the world if you did not have some capacity to do so. And, and, and that speaks to the issue and to the strength of the, of the, of the jurisdiction uh, in terms of the type of businesses that they're operating in. Um, small country, 102 square miles, right? 68,000 people. The only way that you could do that is if it's supported by an infrastructure which is hugely networked or directly networked in terms of the international financial system. And that is the basis on it, of its success. And the fact that it operates uh, at literally at the same levels that any of one of those jurisdictions will, will happen. So I was interested to listen to Paul, certainly in terms of the development of the, of, of the legislation and also um, the fact that the, the interaction and the re response to some of 
what one would consider to be the external pressures to be able to do so. And you have to recognize that as well. Um, the multinational, not the multinationals, the OECD countries um, have, are facing an aging population structure, right? And they are also facing, as was pointed out by the first speaker, a great wealth transfer. And I go back to Walter Ristra. Um, what do we want to do? Well, we want to preserve our wealth. So one is going to look for the jurisdiction that is perhaps um, friendliest, right? But at the same token, offers one fundamental, one fundamental characteristic. It has to have the capacity to engender and ensure my trust and confidence. And that's the key to any successful financial organization. The invisible um, recipe, the invisible ingredient in success is confidence. And the only way that you can have that confidence is if you are operating at an international best practice standard. And that works for literally every area of business that supports financial services, IT, law, infrastructure requirements. Um, you have to be connected to the rest of the world. And considering that in 2004, Cayman was almost wiped out. And when I say wiped out, geographically, that almost disappeared from the map. And it continues to be a strong uh, <clears throat> financial center as we speak. And the only way that you could do that is you, if you have kept all of your links and all of your capacities, which also means disaster preparedness right? and the ability to be able to restart and keep your businesses afloat so that there's no possibility or the risk of loss is minimized. So that Cayman is a success story. One has to accept that. But one also has to remember and look at the unique attributes which make it the British Virgin Islands, Bermuda, um, and some of our other jurisdictions um, successful and allow them to complete with the Delawares of this world, as well as Liechtenstein and a few other, and a few other countries. Now, it requires a huge amount of discipline and a central theme with regard to your human resource capacity, infrastructure. The kind of things that people take for granted and Paul really didn't say too much about in terms of how do you have to do to keep it in position. And that infrastructure has to do with all the other things I talked about, law, the IT, um, the probity, the financial, so the, the, the question of the, um, the IT infrastructure and everything else that goes with that. Uh, you can't run that type of business without having those as a fundamental um, requirement. And in fact, we've taken it for granted. We figure that, you know, this great wealth transfer can take place without that, it can't, right? So that any business, any country, any country that wishes to replicate, to replicate anything that has been done in Bermuda, Singapore, and or um, um, Cayman Islands has to remember um, that the first order of business is that you uh, not merely have to be competitive, right? That you also have to operate at the highest level of legal performance fundamental, right? And the fact that is, of course, uh, uh, an offshore dependency, the fact that at the end of the day, British jurisprudence lies behind it. And we're not to forget that Britain is also a fairly strong financial juris 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 jurisdiction as well for many of the other issues that we talked about. So that there's a knock-on effect, right? Cayman has stood on its own, but there are some uh, knock-on attributes which follow from it. And the bottom line, for any, any Caribbean country that is looking to do anything of that kind, has to remember the primacy of operating literally at the cutting edge of performance. And that I think is the fundamental lesson of it. I, um, for me, anyhow, that I have learned um, from Cayman Islands. Um, I have to say that I have had a little experience if, I, if only because uh, one of the organizations I've worked with, they have an office in, in uh, the Cayman. And I would also say that certainly the largest bank in Trinidad also does. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariano. Thank you very much. Certainly um, working in the offshore industry makes you have to operate at a level uh, like New York, like all the, the big financial centers. I don't think though it's beyond any of the other Caribbean countries. I, I, I think that it's a, le a level of political will and the ability to mobilize uh, legislation. Um, and all, all the different stakeholders to get it done. Um, I'm going to take a question from Howard. I think Howard Dalton, you had a question earlier. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so Paul, um, yes, uh, and congrats to Kiman, but um, how do you perceive the general acceptance of the 15% tax um, on, on companies with an impact Kiman? Because notwithstanding the, the, the utterances that is not a tax haven, people have set up operations there for transfer pricing purposes. How do you perceive that 15% tax will impact you guys? I, I think the initial response is that it isn't going to have uh, much of an impact. And I think for the, for the naked eye, that sounds like a bit of a strange response at first, but it isn't. Because when you read the details of how the, the initiative has been crafted and who, which companies it will impact, it's really impacting a certain type of company with a very, very, very large balance sheet. Um, and we don't have, we don't, we just don't have that profile of, of companies in, in, in Cayman. So your, your Googles and your Amazons, um, I can't say, it would be nice if we did, but I can't say we have many of those in the Cayman Islands. That's where they, what, what, what it's targeting. And they've defined it very clearly in terms of the numbers, which is the amount of profit. I think it's a, I can't, I can't remember, it's a significant amount of profit. Um, that it, the, the, law, the rule states. So at this stage, of course, you know, you never know these things might change. As I said, the goalpost is always moving, so you never know. But at this stage, it doesn't, um, it hasn't caused a lot of concern. There have been discussions about it, but there's no, there's no material concern at this stage because of the way it's crafted. Thank you. Do we have any more questions um, from any of the participants? I have to agree with Paul that part of the biggest challenge is the perception of the industry. Um, the goalposts are always moving. My parents constantly ask me what I do for a living, um, being involved in the trust industry. Um, and they use the language that is used on, on, on TV, you know, tax havens. And, and it, it is a constant struggle to try to educate persons as to what an international financial center is. And, and the fact that we are tax neutral. So it's interesting that you have um, raised that as critical to the education campaign in relation to the tax net neutrality and the fact that these international financial centers actually allow for global trade um, in a way that, that you know, um, just would not have been possible without, without these international financial centers. Um, I'm just going to check around for any other questions before we wrap up. Um, I'm not seeing any hands in the air. So um, I just want to thank Paul. This was a very, uh, very useful uh, conversation. Um, you know, finding out the, 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 the tricks um, and the secrets to the, to the Cayman success. Obviously, in the BBI, we have um, followed suit in a number of ways, um, but Cayman continues to be um, way out front in, in, in a number of key areas like insurance and um, funds and banking. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Professor Ule uh, Roste and um, Mr. Mariana Brown for your insightful um, uh, presentations as well. Mariana, it was good to hear the other side, um, the fact that success does come um, as a result of some natural advantages, as you, you might want to put it that way. Um, uh, but I do believe that the, every Caribbean country has a natural advantage, a comparative advantage that we can draw on. Trinidad has done so with its oil. And maybe we need to find a way to, to turn oil into uh, international finance somehow. Um, but uh, I want to thank all of the panelists, as well as, as Mr. Paul Biles for this session. Thank you for, to Kamala for inviting me to moderate. And thank you for um, all the participants um, for, for staying with us. Thank you so much. Oh, Connie has a question. Sorry. Connie? You, uh, sorry, Shelley, I apologize for the lateness of the question. But I thought since I, I had these esteemed gentlemen and yourself on, I should ask the question. Often uh, the industry we refer to as you have all done collectively um, and individually in your presentations as international financial centers and as offshore centers. And I, I think that there's over the years we have found in Barbados to be a, a, a stigma attached to the use offshore centers. Now, I think that there, there's probably a, even a slight difference between offshore centers and, and tax havens. I appreciate that the OECD has standards you have to, to, to meet 
in order to be to qualify as not being a tax haven. But I think that there probably should be some sort of collective agreement amongst ourselves as, as IFCs around the term offshore. Um, I personally don't like it because I think that that's how people refer to it. When they refer to offshore centers, they say it in a very derogatory way. And I think that the term international financial center sounds more mature and it sounds more, it, it could be aesthetics and it, but I, I just think that usually that's how it, it is, it sounds and is received. So I think that as, as a collective IFC community, we should have a conversation around what we call ourselves and stick with what it is. Yeah, good point. It's uh, one of my favorite topics as well. I think we, um, we, we have gone away from over the past, I would say, eight to 10 years, we've kind of gone away from offshore. We've definitely stuck with IFC, so I, I, I agree with your point. And I, I think some others have also been doing that as well. Um, there's IFC review publication, uh, IFC forum exists now. And um, I think that, that it helps a bit. Um, I, have a, I have to tell you, I have a pretty strong view on the extent to which it's been help, it's, it's, uh, it has been successful. I have watched this very closely. And in fact, it was the purpose of the book I wrote 15 years ago. And I am really not seeing much of a change. Honestly, I must tell you the truth. I, I, we can call ourselves, you know, we can call ourselves whatever. Um, I agree with you that it takes away some of the stigma in terms of the amount of times that is mentioned. But what you will see, and you can do your own research on it, you will see that those who want to portray us negatively continue to use the same term. <laughs> they will never use IFC. Um, you will always see us being referred to as a tax haven or offshore. Um, and curiously, many of our clients are far more familiar with the idea of what the product is when you say offshore, because that's just been what they've been used to as well. But I, I agree with you. I, I, I think we should just keep, keep using IFC. I use IFC, as you saw in my presentation, um, and, and hopefully it goes some way to help. Yeah, that's what I would like to see. I would like to see us hold hands in that education process. And each time it comes up to, to make a deliberate point of, of correcting it, and for us to all get on the same page, because I think that we're diluting um, the efficacy when we lower our standards to accept it when they are referred to it that way. That's just my personal, and I, I, I do feel very strongly about it, I have to say. There, there seems to be, there's a question in the chat. Um, I just, so how do we manage to, how did the Cayman Islands manage to maintain its tax neutral status? Um, well, I, I'm a Caymanian, so I'll tell you the truth. Um, it means that everything else is very expensive in the country. <laughs> so the government has to find a way to raise its revenues. Um, they have to find a way. So, you know, you have to pay for your driver's license. You have to pay all this, all these different things that you have to pay for. Um, it's, it's a lot. And also there is the revenues from, uh, revenues from import duties. Um, so everything that's imported into the country, there's a percentage um, on, on the value that, that goes to the government. Otherwise, the government wouldn't be able to, to do such a fantastic job of um, managing and financing our infrastructure, our healthcare, education, and so on. So, so um, that's the system. It's an indirect tax system. It has one small disadvantage, which is that it means that the cost of living is, is, um, is higher than average. Um, but the big advantage is, you know, it allows a lot of international business to occur because of the tax neutral status, not because of the lack of taxation of the individual or company when they take their funds to their domicile. Thanks for that very important clarification, Paul, um, which again is, is the same as, as in the BVI. Um, it, it is a concerted effort and a decision on the, on the part, I believe, of our political uh, leadership and the private sector as well to, to, to undertake that approach and to remain tax neutral. Um, thanks, Connie, for that question. Um, I, and thanks, Avia, I think, um, for your question as well. Um, so I, I think, as I, as I was saying before, this has been a very insightful um, conversation. Thank you to, to all those who have participated. Thank you, especially to Paul. Um, and I think that this is a good time as any to wrap up. 
So I'm going to hand over to Kamla. Thank you very much, Shelley. That was indeed a very, very good session. It did live up to my expectations, but it also did set the tone to say that there is a whole lot more for us to discuss. I would have liked to hear a whole lot more from Ole. So um, if he doesn't mind, Ole, I'm, I'm just putting you on standby that we will be inviting you again when we can focus a whole lot more time and not just these 45 minutes that we had here today to really discuss this area because clearly it can make a major difference to the economies of the Caribbean islands. All right, so you, you can look forward to hearing. Um, well, you'll get phone calls from Peter, I'm sure, but you'll get emails from me as well, okay? I want to also thank uh, Mariano Brown. Um, Mariano, it, it was so interesting to be able to get that um, additional take from you in terms of how you see us positioning the Trinidad and Tobago International Financial Center and the difference you know, with these other islands. And, and um, so you know that we would be calling on you again. Uh, Paul, so it goes without saying that um, this, this presentation was really indeed very good and we want to hear more. So we will be calling you again as well. Uh, Shelly, thank you so much for um, moderation today. I know we put you under pressure to try and get all this amount of discussion in this short time frame, uh, but because there are so many things we wanted to cover today, you know, we had to limit what time we had available, but you, you really did a marvelous job. So thank you, Shelly. Um, so for our participants, uh, we were supposed to have a half hour break from 12.30 to uh, 1 p.m., but I know that no one would have minded the extra 15 minutes or so that we spent here with um, the session. So we will go on a very short break now. I can't call it a lunch break, therefore, but I hope that you would all get an opportunity to have a quick bite to return at one o'clock when we will move to the session on digitization where our presenter will be um, Dan Meeps. Okay, so we will have the Zoom room still open. Persons can simply um, ensure that their mics are muted and their videos are off. Take a quick 15 minute break, um, have a quick bite and then we return for the next session. Thank you all very much. <laughs>